Hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and on today's Web DM, we're gonna round out the races with the gnome. Nope, ah, fuck. <laughs> we will show this one, no mercy. Okay, no, no, no. We saved the best for last because we're gonna do all the races no matter what. So why don't we go ahead and get to it on Web DM. <laughs> Let's talk about a race that gets that kind of gets a bad rap a little bit. Where, yeah. Gnomes, where do they fit in? I mean, other than trying to sell me like on where to travel. Gnomes are one of those races that I feel like are left in for both legacy yeah. and because they were on the, the drawing board and they're like, oh, what are we gonna include in fifth edition and this, this, and this. And someone was like, we should include gnomes, like as a joke. And then they got left in and then they ended up in the player's hand. Yeah, they took lunch after that and then they mm. came back and forgot that it was- They forgot that it was there. Uh, that's how I see gnomes. They sort of step on the toes of the halfling, not just in that they're a small race. I don't see the distinctions between them as being that distinct. Yeah. And sometimes when I run games, I'm just like, they're the same people. Gnomes are halflings from a different part of the world. They just know how to grow a beard better. Sure, yeah. And then other times I look at gnomes and I, I try to focus in on their like magical qualities, their connection to nature, their sort of fae-like qualities. One of my favorite treatments of gnomes was from uh, Dawnforge, which was the companion setting to Midnight from Fantasy, uh, Fantasy Flight Games. And in Dawnforge, they're sort of from the fey realm and have strong connections back there. Uh, you can see echoes of this in 5th edition with the fade away uh, feat for gnomes mm. in Xanathar's Guide where they can sort of like fade to invisible if they're attacked in combat. It's, it's just hard for me to find a, a place for the gnomes yeah. that stands out and makes them something other than just knock off halflings. And, and so I think it's worth considering the place of gnomes in your world if you're going to include them. And I guess that's why you're watching the video right now. Yeah, I mean, they are. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, I mean, they're, they've been used uh, a little differently in different settings, uh -huh, uh -huh. right? You have the Tinker Gnome, you which the, is kind of like the from... Dragonlance yeah. is where Tinker Gnomes uh, sort of first originate. And then I, I think that, that archetype has been heavily built up by Warcraft. And that Warcraft's influence on Dungeons & Dragons, which is uh, itself influenced by D&D in the first place, uh, it has created this sense that all gnomes are tinkering inventors. Mm -hmm. That they're in their laboratories creating little knickknacks and things. And of course, those are rock gnomes from the player's handbook. Yeah, and they yeah. get the the tinkerer's ability and yeah, yeah, making just pointless machines, trying to be the dad from Gremlins. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> just brush your fucking teeth. You don't just need a teeth. you don't need a thing. I forgot about the dad from Gremlins. Right. And then there's forest gnomes who are, who have that kind of magical fairy quality. Personally, in my homebrew settings. All gnomes are David the gnome. Well, they just are. But I like the idea of gnomes as sort of the caretakers of the little critters. Yeah. That's their place in the world. That they are there to look out for all the small little things of the world that get forgotten. The squirrels and birds and, and varmints and critters and things. Yeah. They sort of work with druids and elves and maybe fey creatures. They're part of that natural world. This dates back to uh, a campaign that we ran in which uh, Emma actually played the gnome yeah. who was modeled on David the gnome yeah. thus creating a whole sort of ecology of tiny little fairies and, and talking with animals and critters and, and inventing these sort of domestic tasks mm -hmm. that the gnomes would be kind of associated with and I just sort of like that in that respect they're not player characters anymore they're part of the, the monsters on Saver Dice that was reflected in the urban gnomes who are chimney sweeps and clean up the streets and everything like that and all they yeah. ask is a little beer or milk uh, yeah. from their <laughs> from the people that they help out. Yeah. I'm here to clean your chimney. Here to clean your chimney. I need a, I need a dram of rum first. Right. I need a hog's head of mead you before need... I'll sweep the dung off the street. Yeah. <laughs> but you want to pay them after. After. <laughs> after. Otherwise they, they might start slinging that shit everywhere. Gnomes get drunk. They really do, uh, particularly in Oracala Palantine. So, but I would also at the same time, even in those settings, if someone comes to me and says, I, this, this, this race is in the player's handbook, I'm going to make a gnome. Then I just tell them straight up, like, you can do that. You can, ha there's nothing about uh, the player's handbook gnomes that I change. They're just a type of halfling. 
Yeah. They call themselves gnomes. Maybe they're from another part of the world or something like that. But I don't separate out and create a separate sort of lore and history and everything else for them. They're just part of the halflings. And then I bring in Goblin as sort of the separate, distinct, smallish race. Um, that's there. That's for my homebrew. Yeah. I mean, there's been a few... Uh Famous gnomes in literature. Sure. Uh, like you mentioned, David the Gnome. My, one of my favorites uh, from the Driss novels. <laughs> Sorry. It's the deep gnome, Belwar Disengulp. Um, yes. It's, it's a Zverf Neblin. Zverf Neblin. Zverf Neblin. Uh, it's a truly tragic. Uh, he is a tragic I mean, character, it's, it's, isn't it's some, he? It's, it's, some it's fucked really up kind shit, of dark. <laughs> you know, where, where some drow cut his hands off yeah. and sent him back. No, he's got his hammer and his pickaxe. Yeah. I like the and I like the deep gnomes as well. First off, deep gnomes offer a lot from a mechanical standpoint, yeah. right? They they have a ton of stuff going for them. And I'd almost kinda like to make like a, a deep gnome rogue to really take advantage of that on demand non detection that they have. I really do see that on demand non detection as a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. given all the information gathering spells that there are in the game. Plus the superior, superior dark vision and the other stuff. I, I like the Smurf Neblin, the Deep Gnome, mm -hmm. um, but there's really not a lot of campaigns where they work. And if I were using them in the game, I'd be like, yeah, you're going to have to have a real good reason to come up on the surface. You're going to have to really sell me on yeah. this character and not just be like, yeah, I'm playing a Deep Gnome. Deal yeah. with it. <laughs> I'm the last of my race. The other two, Forest Gnome and Rock Gnome, if you're not going to go like the gnomes or fey creatures route like I did, then Forest Gnomes are reclusive. Maybe they live in Wood Elf communities. Perhaps even though they're not fey creatures themselves, because of their connection with the natural world, Forest Gnomes are seen as allies of the fey and are often found palling around with satyrs and dryads and nymphs and things like that. Taking thorns out of the paws of bunnies. Oh. And, and rescuing foxes from traps and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, in that respect, they're, they're you know, available for player characters, and I myself play a, a Forest Gnome Paladin, which we'll talk about. It's, uh, it sort of leaves the door open for players to play them while at the same time retaining that kind of magical quality to fairies that, uh, or sorry, to gnomes that, uh, that they have. And then, of course, rock gnomes are just... First off, there's the Warcraft influence, right? Mm -hmm. Steam gears, cogs, things being invented. Uh, I like the Dragonlance Tinker Gnomes because of their Rube Goldberg-like machines. Well, well yeah, <laughs> yeah, they you know, they have these, like, what was the escalator, the elevators that they have? They're like catapults. Yes. And then they'll catch you in a net, but if the net doesn't work, then they have these foam things that come out and uh -huh. break your fall, but then you gotta start all over again being catapulted up. Uh-huh. And it's just like, you know, we already, we already have, you can, just, you can just use stairs. You could just use those stairs. But <laughs> the idea of a, of a group, and I think in Dragonlance they're actually like cursed, the, uh, uh, cursed with an obsession yeah. to make those things. And that's yeah. a really neat idea to, to, to use for like a rock gnome, a tinkerer. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, having like these, this one society of peoples that are obsessed with mechanical invention. First off, if you've never Googled like automatons, and other sorts of curiosities from say the Renaissance onward, you'll be really surprised. Like just Google the history of mechanical Turk, what that phrase refers to. Yeah. Not the people who, who type out Netflix descriptions, but like where a mechanical Turk actually comes from. You'll realize that that's perfect fodder for looking and seeing at what like rock gnomes and tinker gnomes can do. Because pneumatic machines, machines that use counterweights, mm -hmm. machines that appear to have their own autonomy, even though they're not, have been around for a long time. Yeah, a very long time. You can use those kind of real world ideas to sort of inspire you in your tinker gnome, mm -hmm. your rock gnome uh, characters and all the kinds of things that they can come up with. Yeah, because I mean, I, I think one of my favorite of uh, those little automata were the ones that literally uses ink and quill and can write a, like a note out and mm -hmm. dip in and, and, write. Ink and then write. I mean, yeah. you, you could just make the biggest troll ever of a, of a, of a <laughs> troll, of a gnome that, that does those and leaves them for, the, for his enemies. And it's just like, you know, something <laughs> like about your mom or something. But he makes an entire automata. That, that's all its purpose is. It's just to write a big F you uh, right. that he leaves behind for them to just have. leave it here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, gnomes are good for their comedic element. And in, in certain games where comedy is an important part of the campaign, uh, the campaign being at least like open to comedy, the gnomes offer that sort of jolly, prankstery sort of archetype that you can draw on. Whereas halflings are more like 
laid back and like, no, nah, man, we're not going to do it. Like gnomes are like hyperactive and, mm -hmm. and energetic and like, let's go do this. Let's do this thing. Let's, let's not just sit still all day. Where do you think uh, the naming of the gnomes comes from with all the like the fuzzy pop and the fizzle whizzle <laughs> and all that? Like, what do you, is that just, you know what I mean? Curious, right? Mm -hmm. Like where gnomes as the comedy element of, of, of fantasy tropes sort of enters into it, right? Mm. Because Halflings never got that. I don't know if it's because of the, the influence of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings on it. I would assume that those names come from like fairy tale yeah. type stuff and that gnomes kind of get saddled with that because they're saddled with all this sort of fairy tale baggage that's been, that's yeah, turned into just sort of like, they're goofy. It's kind of that, yeah, that goofy language. Yeah, like Fiddlesticks. A, do, yeah, do like a gnome druid named like Conifer Thistle Bliss. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> right. That's actually... That's not a bad idea. Yeah. You should write that down. Um, and Just so, call me Connie. I guess maybe the best treatment of gnomes that I've seen in a Dungeons & Dragons world is Everon. Yeah. Because it treats them as full participating members of the world. Not an afterthought. Not a, oh yeah, they have a whole nation and country and everything. But it's never done anything important. Just don't forget about them. Zalargo and and House Civis, uh, the, 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 house, uh, the Dragonmark House of Scribing. They're fully present in Eberron's history. And this is one of the reasons I really like Eberron. We have done a, a, a Patreon podcast over Eberron. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the reasons that I really like Eberron is because it finds a place for all of the races in Dungeons and & Dragons and gives them equal treatment. And it's not like the author spent a ton of time on elves and a little bit less on humans and a little bit less on dwarves. And by the time they got to gnomes, they were just like, fuck it, they're tinkery and comedic. They're kind of small like halflings and they got some magic like elves and they t they, they build shit like dwarves. Ah. Yeah, that's what I like about them. And so if you are looking for a depiction of gnomes that gives some thought to them and, and treats them as fully participating members of the setting, Mm -hmm. with an influence on the politics and history of it, with a place in the current world, then maybe look to Eberron and see how Zalargo's treated and how the gnomes that are there uh, are, are worked into the setting. And they still have the fairy origins. They still have, they're still distinctly gnomes, but the way they're treated and, and the, the way that the, the setting is constructed, it means that they're, they're given more importance than they are. Like, like where are gnomes from in Forgotten Realms? That's my thing. That's what, that was my answer as well. <laughs> S places somewhere, yeah. Uh, somewhere in. <laughs> but there's not like far, far. like if you if, if if you were just sort of like a casual player in a Forgotten Realms game, you would know. Okay, well, I can be an elf from Silvery Moon. I can be a dwarf from Gauntlegrim or Mirabar or something like that. Mm. There are barbarians north of the of the spine of the World Mountains. Uh, wizards come from Luskin and and places like that. You kind of know where on the map the different classes and races are supposed to be from. And that gives new players a chance to be like, well, I don't really know where I'm from, but I want to play a knight. And the DM can just go, well, there's knights in Cormier. You can be from there mm -hmm. and, and have made your way to the Sword Coast. But in terms of like gnomes, it's one of those things where it's like, there's gnomes everywhere, but they don't mm -hmm. seem to have a place on the map. Yeah. Contrast that with Eberron, where you a, a new player in Eberron can just go, yeah, all right, I'll be from Zalargo, I'll have the Dragon Mark or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you, they've got that place in the world for themselves. Oh, I remember. Alaska. Alaska. That's yes. where they're from. No. Um, Alaska. Question for you. Do, would you consider uh, in Star Wars, I know we're taking on a bit of an aside. Uh oh. But are those gnomes that are trying to that, that disassemble C-3PO? Tink tinker gnomes that are trying to disassemble them. Yeah, they're sure. Short. They're uh -huh. the, the fuzzy white hair kind uh -huh. of, right, sure. right? What are they, Ergnots or whatever they're yeah. called? Ugnots. 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 Thank you, producer Travis. Ugnots. Um, Member of uh, Star Wars Insider since he was a boy. Since a long time <laughs> since ago. Since a long time ago. <laughs> I would consider them something like that. And if you're looking to like sci-fi or space fantasy, your Dungeons and Dragons up, drawing on those kinds of inspirations uh, certainly are, uh, are only going to help to make things uh, easier on you as mm -hmm. a dungeon master. Yeah, let's get to archetypes. So, gnomes. Yeah. What are they good at? What do they like to do, right? They I, like to be with animals, right? I'm assuming, yeah. You know, it, But they like to build. But they like to build. But that, and that's the thing with gnomes, is like the two subtypes that they have are very different. Mm -hmm. And like you can say the same with like high elves and wood elves, right? There's a lot of synergy there, or a lot of parallels between high elves and, and wood elves and uh, forest gnomes and, and rock gnomes. But at the same time, 
the Wood Elf and the High Elf are still distinctly elves, and you get the impression that a High Elf in a Wood Elf location or, or town would be okay, mm-hmm. and vice versa, but I don't always get that feel from like forest gnomes and, and rock gnomes. It yeah. really does sort of feel like that they're two separate and distinct peoples. Yeah. Or like Stout Heart and Lightfoot halflings. I don't see them as being that distinct from each other. No, not really. You Just know. One's a little smaller and can hide better, and the other one's a little tougher. Elves, I mean, high elves, you can still see. I still see them in the forest. They just build with magic as opposed to live in the trees. Right. Right? With gnomes, it really does feel like one lives in a hole in the tree, mm-hmm. and the other one builds his his whole thing in the side of a mountain with a thing, and it's well, like, and he might as well just be a small bomb, dwarf. But, yeah, he might just well be a small dwarf. And and so there have been times when I've, I've treated them, instead of uh, gnomes being other halflings, they are basically like dwarves. You know, it's weird. I think forest gnome, I would almost go with like arcane trickster as a good archetype for them, or illusionist and enchanter. First off, they have the stats that that, that lend themselves towards wizard, right? Like, they get that intelligence, intelligence boost. Bonus, yeah. In this case, uh, I believe forest gnomes get a dexterity uh, uh, for themselves. You can have kind of a character that really builds with that illusion, that using deception to protect the place that they've called home. Mm-hmm. Maybe some kind of weird combination of illusionist and druid. So that they've got some nature magic there, but they're mostly f- fooling and tricking people with their illusions and enchantments and things. Mm. Like a tiny little John Hammond that is creating a preserve for animals not to show people, <laughs> but to keep them safe. <laughs> to keep them safe, yeah. yeah. So I think that for like forest gnomes. Now, for rock gnomes, Artificer jumps out immediately as being sort of the, like, well, let's just take this one step further and they're no longer tinkering, they're building full-on weapons. You know, the Unearthed Arcana Artificer is more about like magic item creation and everything, but they do have that mechanical construct. Mm -hmm. You could go with something like the Gunslinger for them, or maybe even the Alchemist. And um, particularly if you describe your magic items as being more mechanical in nature than they are strictly magical, uh, that's that's maybe how I would take that archetype uh, for the gnome. Well, yeah, and then you got to build a big bear suit to be inside of, right? And then you need to build a giant bear suit that you can climb inside of with your gnome, with great big buzzing saws, <laughs> belching steam, and <laughs> there's grease and oil everywhere, mm-hmm. and yeah, or a tiny little Ripley that builds her own little mech suit little to mech come water. out and. and <laughs> Protect, protect all the little newts in the all forest. All the tiny little newts in the forest. <laughs> like, just go full on wizard. And, and and regardless of what kind of gnome that you are, just be a wizard. Illusionist is is one that like... It already lends itself to it. And and has a legacy with Dungeons and Dragons. The gnome illusionist is is one of those that's been present in, in every edition it's the, the, those that race class combo has been sort of a part of. Mm-hmm. And so it has a strong thematic element to it. You're really leaning into that archetype. And that works to me for both forest and tinker gnome, that sort of illusionist. Uh, for gnome. Yeah, or do you like, have any others that are like any other gnome, two type gnome stuff? No, no. Two type gnome? Two type gnome. He's a, he's a stenographer, but he's stenographer in two languages at once. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, oh, that's not what you That's meant. not really what I was oh, thinking sorry. about. That's just, kind of hard to justify taking on an adventure. Well, he's, he's I he's mean, he records everything that goes on. He would be on. the bard, and he records everything that yeah, goes on. And he's, he's the guy when they're having an argument about where, like you said, we should go left. Yeah. Actually, you, I noticed that you said we should go right back there, and the party <laughs> followed you. And he's uh, just like, actually! Thanks, Harold. <laughs> thanks. I enjoyed the hell out of the, the two or three times I've had a chance to play my forest gnome paladin. Yeah. What's his name again, I'm sorry? Now, uh, Sir Pygmy Wart Grump yeah. is a, a distinguished member of the, the Order of the Unicorn, and along with his trusty riding mastiff, Ambrose, uh, he sees his, um, his role as a literal protector of the forest and all things in it. Uh, Oath of Ancients Paladin, obviously, mm-hmm. and uh, he uses a bearded long axe, which is a battle axe. I like the idea of a small, fully armored... Uh, character and I mostly to me I, one time I went to the Tower of London and saw like the suit of armor for uh, Edward Henry VIII's son and it was like eight years old and I was like that is plate mail for an eight year old and I was like that's what the halflings and gnomes wear yeah and, <laughs> and still would be terrifying it still would be terrifying now give the guy a battle axe and have him start taking out knees and feet and groins and and I think he's quite a terror the fact that he's mounted means he gets to use a d10 sorry a d12 lance uh, whenever he's on his uh, on the back of his mount, and so I, it's just a uh-huh. fun sort of like 
character to play. One-handed D12 weapon, man. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. So I, I kind of think that um, I play him more like a Don Quixote, sort of like he's a bit off his rocker, um, a, a, a bit uh, foolhardy and... and uh, believes in sort of the chivalric ideal of knighthood, mm -hmm. um, and and I I find it's it, it's been a very satisfying character to play, um, despite the fact that I I chose to pair up Forest Gnome with Paladin, and I don't know that anybody would ever recommend you doing that. I am here to tell you you should do that because it's really fun. One would think that like a Forest Gnome would be a good druid. You would think so, yeah. And I right. think, like, thematically it fits very well. But because the stat synergy isn't there, you could consider it, like, going against type. Yeah. But thematically, come on. Yeah. They already can speak to small animals and, and, and have that connection there. They're already in the forest, reclusive, seeing themselves as sort of the protectors of the little, little guy. Why not go that last final step? And now you've got a tiny, or sorry, small, druid who can uh, turn into a giant bear when they need to. Exactly. Barbarian is one we kind of, I know we kind of talked about in like Halfling, your, your Barbarian, Roscoe, Three Stone, but a lot of that kind of applies to to the gnomes as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I almost sort of like the idea of a feral gnome or, or something, um, but even just like fighter. Uh, you could easily do like an archer or something like that with a gnome and, and, and not have to worry so much about them being small. Um, but just anything that, that plays off the fact that they're tiny, and yet have the, pow the full power of the class uh, is gonna be one of those where you can kind of like play against type and be like, yeah, I really am kind of a badass warrior despite the fact that I'm a yeah. and make barely it two foot tall gnome. Yeah, and you know, that's how that's, if you want, that's if you wanna play your gnome insanely serious, you can then bring comedy to it because, you know, a, a tiny little gnome being a badass but proclaiming as such. Yeah. Uh, hey, that's, that's entertainment for the whole party, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, gnomes make parties happen. Gnomes are not a popular race, I think. I don't see many played. They seem to have the, they'd be the butt end of jokes. Yeah, I mean, um, well, at least here. Right. <laughs> There's a cutesy element to it that I think turns off a lot of people when they think about playing uh, in, in, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is, is everything's exaggerated in it, yeah. right? Everything's over the top, larger than, than life. life. Yep. Yeah, that's, and so it's like you play, you're playing heroes, right? And you're saving the world. And here's this archetype that's in there that's comedic. That's perhaps the object of, of scorn and, and derision. That's not a, a big damn hero, but is instead one of the little guys and, mm -hmm. and not physical in stature and nature. And they're different from halflings enough like, I, I really don't understand why halflings don't get the same treatment and why like gnomes are singled out and people are like, no, I will never include a gnome in my campaign. I was yeah. like, but halflings? You do kobolds, but not gnomes? Yeah. Kobolds are fucking stupid. Yeah. I really don't like kobolds. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't get why gnomes are singled out, but I, I, I look around on, on different places online and you can see it constantly where people are just like, no, gnomes are stupid, I don't like them. Um, I'm here to say if you feel that way, then you should watch a lot of David the Gnome. Yeah. And just look around you. And it's a magical look at world. Everything there is to see. It's a magical world. Yeah. And trolls and wizards and fairy tales, birds that talk and fish that sing. And every wish and dream and happy home, you'll find the kingdom of the gnomes. I think probably the influence of Critical Role that bards would be called sort of in archetype uh, for gnomes, despite the fact that um, you know that, that that gnomes don't really have a stat that lends itself well towards bards. The influence of Critical Role might be such that mechanics be damned. This is an archetype that people associate with uh, with gnomes now. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's for the the uh, the first campaign for Critical Role, not the new one that started uh, last week. Um, I'm not sure when this is going to air. I'm just rambling on camera now. Um, <laughs> Jim, that's all we ever do. Is that's just all we ever do. Camera, last, so you can't the last really... episode of a day of, of filming is always a grab bag of uh, whatever.